turn to your neighbor and tell them divine destiny. Even though God has a plan, a purpose, and a destiny for our life, it is totally up to us whether we're going to fulfill it or totally ignore it. Question is, can you get to heaven without fulfilling your destiny? And I would say, yes, you can. Because the prerequisite for eternal life is belief in Jesus Christ. You know, so yeah, you can get to heaven without doing anything about your destiny. However, do you want to enter eternity knowing fully well that you did everything within your power to do what God destined for you to do? I got one yeah for that. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 13, verse 36, and it says, after David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors. I don't know about you, but I think that's a pretty awesome testimony. I would li like for that to be said about me. When I die on my tombstone, I'd love to have it written, Terry lived and died doing the plan and the purpose of God in his life and his generation. And I think that should be our prayer, to desire to do what God destined for us to do. We're going to be um, studying a passage that's found in the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to pick up some valuable lessons in regards to destiny, divine destiny here this morning. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 19. We're going to read verse 16 onwards. Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask about what is good, Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. According to tradition, he was around 24 years of age. He's an aristocrat. He's apparently very well educated in the Jewish traditions and customs. He has done everything right up until that problem, but he still felt that his life was not complete. Have you ever asked this question, is this all there is to life? Because that's the question this rich young man was asking himself because he believed there was more to life than what he had experienced so far. You might think that someone who had arrived both in the sense of wealth and influence would find accomplishment and fulfillment in that. And I would say it's not just this rich young man who, who was dealing with this sense of emptiness over the centuries, several people, both in our time and times past, have asked the same question. Is there more to life than this? Even though several of these people appeared to have achieved what we would perceive as success and fame and wealth, the emptiness within them would drive many of these people eventually to take their own life because they could not find the answer to this soul-searching question, is there more to life than this? I would like to submit to you this morning, yes, there is more to life than this. There is more to life than waking up every day and going to your job. There is more to life than building your dream home or buying your dream car. There's more to life than a big fat bank account. There's more to life than having 10,000 likes for your new profile pic on Facebook page. The breath of God that breathed into Adam in the Garden of Eden was a life of purpose. It was a breath of purpose. God never intended for us to live a self-centered life. His plan and His purpose for each of us is to live a life that is beyond ourselves, To make an impact. To be a man or a woman who would influence, who would touch, 
lives around them in the time that they live here on planet Earth. There is a divine destiny upon every single person that is seated here in this auditorium. Whether you like it, whether you want it, you will have it. There is a destiny of God upon your life. There is a call of God upon your life to do something. Divine destiny requires full obedience. Divine destiny requires full obedience. When it comes to God's purposes, there is no negotiating. Have any, any of you ever experienced that? Have you ever tried negotiating with God? We never come out winning negotiations with God. He is an excellent negotiator. It's either his way or no way. You would think that Jesus, knowing fully well who this young man was who had come to him asking this question, you know, when he answered him saying, hey, go sell all your possessions and then come follow me. And when the guy refused and walked away, you would think Jesus would say, oh, come on, I can do something. Hey, hey hold on here, man. To go and sell the possessions that you have not used for the last year and come and serve me. That's what they think. You would think that Jesus would do that. You know, do something to help the guy to, to follow Jesus. But it almost is astonishing that Jesus does nothing to pursue this man. He does nothing to try to, you know, negotiate with him or try to find common ground. He just puts the truth as it is. He says, if you want to follow me, dude, you give up everything, your possessions, your life, and then come follow me. And he does nothing to persuade him beyond saying that. And you ask yourself, why? Why did Jesus allow him to walk? And I think the answer to that question is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. In other words, Jesus fully knew the condition of the human heart. We are incapable of serving two masters. You might be able to manage it for a while, but I tell you, in time, eventually the plot will unravel. It's like in the movies, where a guy tries to date two girls at the same time. Have you ever seen those scenes? It appears to work for a few moments, and then suddenly it all crumbles and backfires. It can't work. You can't serve two masters. And there are some of us who are seated here this morning that are struggling with this. We're trying to make it work. I want Jesus, but I'm not sure if I want to let go of that. I love Jesus, but I also love this world and what it has to offer. I want to pursue God, Pastor. I want to pursue the plans of God, but at the same time, I also want to pursue my desires and my plans. Church, what we fail to understand and what this young man also failed to understand was... That everything we need and everything we will ever need is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer. He is our everything. He is our great. He is our small. Every kind of fulfillment that you ever desire can be found in Jesus Christ. If only that young man had actually responded to Jesus and given up his possessions and followed him, he would have been far more wealthier than he could have ever imagined. He would have been much more influential. And more than all of that, he would have lived a life of great meaning and purpose. But he failed to understand that actually giving up in the kingdom means gaining in the kingdom. That's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He says, seek the kingdom first. Above all else, seek the kingdom and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. That's what Jesus said. He says, hey guys, would you take a moment and would you look beyond your kingdom's purposes and the kingdom's plan and when you pursue it righteously everything that you ever dreamt of everything that you ever wanted everything you ever needed I'll take care of it there's a call going out this morning that says there's more to life 
than what you're experiencing right now. There's more to life than just mere existence. God says, I have a plan and a purpose when I created you. I have a destiny for your life. But for that destiny to be fulfilled in your life, Jesus says, I want everything. I want all of you. Read this again and again. Again, there's another interaction that was recorded in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, where Jesus says these words. He says, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It's almost like God wanted to make sure that nothing was left out when he made that statement. He says, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, I want it. I want you to love me with everything. There is no negotiation with Jesus Christ. It's either fully given or fully not given. There is no middle ground. There are some of you who think you can stand in the middle ground in terms of following Jesus Christ. I submit to you this morning, there's no such thing as a middle ground when it comes to following Jesus Christ. You're either all in or you're all out. There's no half in and half out with Jesus Christ. You either believe Him fully in every area of your life and give Him everything that you are or don't believe Him and stay away from Him. There's a call going out where, where God is saying, I want people to follow me with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their strength, with all their soul. Here's the second thing about divine destiny I want to leave with you here. Divine destiny is eternal, not temporary. Divine destiny is eternal, not temporary. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 11, the Bible says, God made everything beautiful for its own time. And it says, he's planted eternity in the human heart. In other words, God planted a desire in our hearts to do things that have eternal value. Every single person knows in their heart of hearts that there is more to life than the time that they spend here on earth. Whether they agree on it or not, they know it in their heart of hearts. That's why man seeks salvation. That's why we're so curious to understand what happens beyond life here on earth. What happens after I die? The Bible says that God placed eternity in our hearts, meaning not only do we know that there is more to life than just living, but there is this sense of restlessness. I'll say it again. There's a sense of restlessness, a sense of emptiness until we do something that has eternal significance. Why would a young man at the prime of his life who has everything that anyone would ever dream of, wealth, fame, influence, come up to Jesus and ask him this question, is there more to life than this? Maybe you're seated here and you have high aspirations in regards to education. Maybe you have high aspirations in regards to your business. You want to achieve something great in your life. And I want to warn you this morning and tell you that at the end of all your achievements, success and education and your, and your awards, you'll still walk away with a sense of emptiness and longing. Why? Because God, who is your creator, when he made you, he placed eternity in your heart. And until you discover his purpose and his destiny for your life, all of life's achievements will only lead you to where this young man stood. Frustration. Is there more to life than this. When Jesus answers the young man's question by telling him, he says, hey, guy, you know, because he kind of takes pride, this guy. You know, Jesus, you know, says, hey, follow the law. He, he rattles Jesus and says, I followed everything. I followed do not murder. I followed do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie. I've done it all. You know, he was waiting for Jesus to commend him and say, man, you are such a righteous dude. Eternity is guaranteed for you. Walk away right now. 
But Jesus shocks him and he says, go give away everything you own and then come follow me. And the Bible says when he heard these words, his heart dropped and he walked away sad because he had great wealth. And I want to tell you that in the pursuit of the destiny of God, there comes a time where you must decide between the temporal and the eternal. And this is what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. He says, For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. I would say to you, of all the people who walk here on planet Earth, those who call themselves Christians need to be aware of this more than anyone else. That this world that we live in is not our home. We have a home that we're walking towards. Everything you're seeing around you is temporary. All the pursuit of wealth is fading. Everything that you're experiencing right now is just for a moment. The Bible again and again says the life of a man is like a breath. It's gone. Before you know it, you're done. And all of us need to walk with this understanding that there is a difference between the temporary and the eternal. And then whenever we're given the choice, as a child of God, we need to lean on the eternal and not on the temporary. When the choice is given in your workplace, when the choice is given in your education, in your school, in your college life, whether you're going to choose between the eternal or the temporary, you lean on the eternal. Because there's more to life than here. I came across this interesting uh, poem that was penned by C.T. Studd, a famous cricketer uh, from the late 1800s, who I thought really captured what I'm trying to say this morning. And um, he dedicated his life in pursuit of the divine destiny of God for him. Amazing things. He actually even pastored a church up in Uti for quite a few years. This church still stands. You can go see it. C.T. Studd. And he write, writes a poem, and I just took a few excerpts out of it to put in front of you. This is what his poem says. It says, only one life. Yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then... In that day my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life, it'll soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aim to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life, it'll soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn. And from the world now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life, it'll soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I hear the call, and I'll know and I'll say, it was worth it all. Only one life, it'll soon be passed. What's done for Christ will last. Somewhere along the road, we've lost the meaning of what it means to be a Christ follower, church. Following Christ is not a matter of convenience, it's a matter of conviction. We become a generation that is more concerned with, with the convenience of life rather than the conviction of the call of God upon our life. And I want to call you this morning back again to the purpose of God. It was not an accident that God placed you here on earth. It was not by chance you happened to live here in this city and do what you're doing. There is a divine purpose in every single thing that's happening in your life right now. God is not a God of chance. He's a God of purpose. He does things with eternal purposes. And he's calling his children and he says, would you stop for a moment living in the, in the temporal and would you step out with me and see what I see in regards to the grand scheme of things, eternity, and what I want to do in your life and through your life to impact not just you, but eternity through you. When it comes to God, there's no such thing as a small purpose or a big purpose. Every single thing that is done for God is of significance. 
every little act. That small little decision you make in your college to do something to stand up for God, that's significant in the eyes of God. God does not underwrite every, any, anything as a small thing. Anything we do for eternity, anything we do for the purposes of God has great value. To the point that God says in his words, if you were to give someone a glass of cold water in my name, I'm going to make sure you get your reward, God says. And if he took so much concern in, in a glass of cold water, I tell you, he takes greater pride when you stand up for your faith in your college. When you stand up in your business and say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he will save you. I believe that he's got a purpose and a plan for your life. When children of God stand up for the destiny that God has placed in their life, it brings him so much joy. Divine destiny is eternal, not temporal. We got to stop living in the now and thinking about what God has in the grand scheme of things in eternity. The third thing about divine destiny is divine destiny brings eternal fulfillment. Divine destiny brings eternal fulfillment. Aren't you glad that Peter was one of the disciples of Jesus? If Peter was not one of the disciples of Jesus, many of our questions would not have been answered. Because no one else was as bold as Peter. Everyone thought it, but Peter said it. So listen, like Peter's watching this entire interaction. He's standing beside Jesus, watches this rich young man ask this question, and Jesus snubbing him, and the young man walking away disappointed, and Peter's like, oh man, I gotta ask Jesus this question that's burning within me. Come back to passage here, verse 23 of 19. We'll just pick up the context, and I want you to see what Peter does. And the Bible says, then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. This is after the young man walks away. He says, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Hallelujah. There's hope for everyone. And here comes Peter, steps into the scene. Peter answered him. You know, can you hear this little whiny voice of his? He's whining to Jesus like, we've left everything to follow you. What then will, will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me now will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. It's hard for us while living here on earth to get a grasp of what eternity is. I struggle with this myself sometimes. When I get frustrated doing what I'm doing, you know, I, I sometimes forget that what I'm doing has eternal significance. I gotta remind myself because when we live here on earth, we kind of forget that there's more to life than what we're experiencing on an everyday basis. And that's why Jesus, at many occasions when he was teaching the disciples, would time and time again would point them to what would happen in eternity, to what would take place after life on earth, because he wanted the disciples to understand that there was more to life than what they were experiencing at that moment. And I tell you, whatever you may sacrifice or give on the account of your faith in Jesus Christ, Whatever you may give up in your pursuit of the divine destiny of God, whether it be your dream house, your dream car, whether it may be your family, your brother, your sister, your father, your mother, or children, I tell you the promise of God is you will receive it back a hundredfold, not only, the Bible says, not only in the days to come, but also today. 
Because God is no debtor to no man who ever gave anything up to follow Him. In other words, God is teaching His disciples. He says, guys, you know, Matthew 16, 25, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life, you will gain it. I want to wrap up this morning with an interesting story that I read about a, a young man called William Borden. A young man who lived in the early 1900s. And he graduated from a high school in Chicago. And he was an heir to the Borden dairy business, which was a very successful business in Chicago. And they were millionaires. So at his high school graduation, his parents gifted him a trip around the world. This is in the 1900s, to go around the world as a high school graduation gift. And this young guy, Bill, goes around the world to the Middle East, to Asia, to Europe. And as he travels around, he sees the hurting needs of people and feels a strong urge within him to do something about it. So when he comes back after his world tour, he tells his parents, I want to give my life to prepare myself for the mission field, he says. And then, William took his Bible and he wrote at the back of his Bible these two words that said, no reserves. No reserves. So when he began his education, he went to a very prestigious university called the Yale University. And even as he began, he resolved that as he would study in that university, he would do something for the purpose of God while he learned. In the first year, he made an entry into his personal journal that said, say yes to Jesus and no to self every time. During his first semester at Yale, he started a movement that would transform the campus life in the University of Yale. One of his friends describes what happens. He says it was you know, well into the first term when Bill and I were seated and we were praying together after breakfast. I cannot say whose suggestion it was, but I am sure it must have been originated from Bill. We'd been meeting only for a short time, and when a third student joined us, and soon after a fourth student, and the time we spent in prayer would be followed by a brief reading of scripture where Bill will talk about the Bible. He would read to us and show us something that God showed him that day from the Bible and share his faith. And, and this guy, Bill's small morning prayer group, was the beginning of a movement that would start in his campus, that would spread throughout his campus, that at the end of his first year as a student, 150 first years would gather every day after breakfast and sit down, read the Bible, and pray together. And by the time, I'm not done, by the time Bill was in his last final year, listen to this, 1,000 of the 1,300 students in the entire university would come together and meet in small groups and pray and read the Bible together. <clears throat> because Bill resolved, while I'm in university, I'm going to do something for God. And his passion did not limit himself to just his students. He wanted to do something beyond the students in this college. So he would reach out in the evenings, go to the byways and the alleyways around Chicago where he lived, and he would go and minister and speak to those who were drunk, speak to those who were passed out by the street, those who were hurting, he would go and heal them and help them. He would use his wealth, his finances, in helping people who were in trouble. At the end of his education at Yale, the missionary call that God placed upon him clarified and strengthened. He determined that he would go and be a missionary in China, and not just to the people of China, but to the Muslims who would live in China. That was what his desire and his passion was. So he would prepare himself at the end of his studies to leave. And one of his classmates would say this about Bill, you know, he would say, whenever we came around Bill, he was one of those strongest characters I've ever known. He would put the backbone into the rest of us at college. There was real iron in him. 
and I felt like he was the stuff martyrs were made of in heroic missionaries of modern times. And although this guy was a millionaire, he made a decision. I'm going to use everything I have to, divine, to pursue the divine destiny that God has for my life. Upon graduation, he turned down several high-paying jobs and took the step to go as a missionary towards China. Before he left, he wrote in his Bible, the back of his Bible, these two words. No retreats. No retreats. As he left for China, he traveled through Egypt, hoping to stay in Egypt for a little while to learn you know, the language so that he could minister to the Muslims in China, you know, so that he could learn Arabic. And as he lived in Egypt for a month, he contracted spinal meningitis. And within a month, 25-year-old William Borden was dead. When the news of the death of William reached back to the U.S. from Egypt, a wave of sorrow swept around the entire United States because they realized that he not only gave away his wealth, but he gave himself away and everything that he had for the pursuit of God and the call of God upon his life. Now the question is, was Borden's untimely death a waste? I would say no, not in God's plan. Because prior to his death, Borden had written two more words at the end of his Bible. Underneath the words, no reserves, and underneath the words, no retreats, he wrote the word, no regrets. And as I wrap up this morning, I want to tell you, for anyone who pursues the divine purpose of God, whatever you do in regards to the purpose of God, there is absolutely no regrets. There's no regrets. I would rather come to the end of my life and know that <laughs> I lived my life knowing fully well that I did what God called me to do in my day and my generation, to live a life of no regrets. And I tell people this all the time. It's not a matter of how long you live here on earth that defines who you are. It is how purposeful you live in the short time that you do have here that defines who you are. And as you leave this morning, as you go back to your, your life, your world, I want the words of C.T. Studd to ring in your hearts. The words that he penned down in this poem, he said, only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I hear the call, I know I'll say it was worth it all. Only one life, it'll soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last.